So thank you for coming, and I hope I can give you interesting information about um, my current research, my current work on the materiality of voice and voice databases, and more specifically uh, on the so-called accent recognition software. Um, so I'm originally trained as a designer, um, luckily more and more out of that field right now, but I'm being for, for a couple of years now, I've been interested in the, um, in the power relationships embedded in the history of certain sounds, but also the sounds of certain histories. And for me, I'm, I have been always interested in how sound, um, sound mediating devices, sound mediating artifacts produce or create, produce in the world sounding bodies sounding selves, how we change our sounding selves when we become coupled or connected with certain devices. And more specifically, the power relationships that arise from this production of bodies, from this production of selves. Meaning, who gets to claim autonomy over the sounding self? Who gets to claim ownership over your own sonic subjectivity, and who gets what? What are the political intricacies at play of who is allowed to claim ownership of a sounding self? I hope I can make that a little bit clearer as I go along. But for me, I understand listening as a cultural phenomenon that emerges from this uneven, very uneven and unbalanced power relationship, and in turn, listening also determines how uh, bodies are produced. So listening, I, the way I understand listening is to be among, of course, many other things, a site for the production of otherness. So um, two years ago, I, I wrote my PhD thesis on, in design, but I, I extensively wrote about um, the, art, the sonic articulations of police violence in Brazil, especially in connection with uh, how, how racism in Brazil is actually also a, a, a sonic uh, phenomenon especially when it comes to the actions, the violent actions of the military police. And of course, I am not taking this out of my head. I, um, there are other authors writing on that, spe specifically Jennifer Stover. She has this fantastic book called The Sonic Color Line, in which she argues, and funnily enough, um, I mean, I, I know her, we, we were in touch when I was writing my thesis, but I, um, we were writing a, a little bit about the same things, at the same time, and basically like the core idea is that race is, is a phenomenon that is not only seen, but also heard. So racism also arises from bodily engage engagements with uh, sonic phenomena and in turn produce bodies. There are always certain bodies, there are always considered to be too loud, too shrill, too accented, just bodies that are considered too much. And these bodies are produced by the mechanisms of what certain authors, especially Latin American authors, would call coloniality, which is a continu conti the continuity of the project of ontological hegemony uh, and obliteration of other subjectivities, uh, whose starting point is, in many respects, with European colonialism in the 15th and 16th centuries. So coloniality is the, a project of ontological dominance that does not end with the expropriation of land. Coloniality, on the other hand, sustains and informs the production of knowledge until this day. So techniques that we use until this day in order to produce knowledge were established pretty much by the project of modernity slash coloniality. Because we cannot understand modernity without understanding coloniality. This is not my claim. But I pretty much agree with it. Techniques such as, for instance, sorting, classifying, ranking, taxonomizing are at the core of the colonial project. Right, so colonial expeditions in, in South America, they brought along botanists, artists, and scientists whose, ta whose task was to make sense of bodies that the colonizers saw as, as belonging closer to nature, bodies that belong closer to nature than the white body, the European body. So defining this relationship between nature and culture as distinct from one another, intrinsically distinct, creates these bodies who are thought of and constructed to belong to either one of them, and that the white cisgendered uh, male body is seen as the archetype for what human is. So this ontological scheme also informs how the products of otherness, 
So the bodies who are considered to be by this project to not belong to the category of human, to be less human, less entitled to humanity, less um, welcome in the project of humanity. One of the things that uh, I argue and other authors also, also argue is that they are marked visually but as well as orally. That also involves speech, of course. So speech understood as proper speech also navigates through these markers and informs their accordingly. So categories like this, ca this fabricated categories like prosody, pronunciation, inflection, loudness, timbre, they all become also these markers that can be placed upon certain bodies. For instance, um, Ana Ochoa Gautier, this author, Colombian author, wrote this fantastic book called Orality in which she investigates um, pre-colonialism or like in the beginnings of colonialism, the, 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 un, the workings of voice and listening in uh, Colombia. And she recalls how Alexander von Humboldt, one of the so-called European explorers, would listen to the bogas, so the rowers, the boat rowers of uh, Caribbean Colombia, um, how they would sound like animals. These are the way that he wrote about those boat rowers. So the, percep the perception of animality of those bodies close, co being closer to nature um, becomes also a marker of colonial dominance. So coloniality also tries to stabilize language as a marker of its dominance. Think about all the indigenous languages that have been historically banned when colonizers impose the language upon upon certain peoples. So my work and my, my research has been uh, trying to identify the persistence of coloniality in listening. And after I finished my PhD thesis for writing about uh, police violence, I shifted my attention to the policing of bodies in the border space. So I see the border as a contemporary site of coloniality, a contemporary site for the production of otherness. And the border space, especially aided by the use of biometric technologies, technologies that are supposed to measure certain uh, so-called biological traits of the human body, becomes an extension of this project of coloniality, a mechanism of, for the regulation and control of bodies. And as uh, stated in the introduction, I understand biometry not to be only embedded within the technology, but also to be a performative gesture. And what I mean with that is that biometry is delegated from systems to citizens. So enacting this idea of the see or hear something, say something, extends the reach of the border to, the, to everyday life. So the borderlands become embedded within everyday life and citizens becomes, a, becomes agent of coloniality, agents of this biometric technology as well. Because it creates, what, what, it, what it sets itself to do is to create the idea of the criminal body as opposed to the good citizen, to the non-criminal body. And the criminal body, of course, is never free of racialization, be, they, be this racialization seen or heard. Uh, you probably know this, this is everywhere in Belgium, right? Um, so to that idea of biometric technologies becoming the site for the production of otherness, um, I bring you three and a half quotes, essentially, from scholars that have extensively uh, discuss this. So Heather Murray, for instance, writes, and I quote, biometric technologies are constituted by the practices of their use. It's performativity bound to and producer of cultural understandings of authority and criminality. Other scholar called Louisa Moore, also a fantastic scholar, wrote that biometry, and I quote, biometry is a site of regulation in order to render life amenable to intervention and management. Simone Brown uh, wrote in her book, Dark Matters, about the construction, the racial construction of biometric technologies that, quote, biometric measurements reveal the workings of racism. And I paraphrase that to say they reveal the workings of coloniality as well, precisely in the moment of observation, of, of listening. So the moment in which biometric technologies observe the body, the moment in which biometric technologies listen to a sounding body, that's where these measurements reveal the workings of, of racism. And subsequently, these workings of races, racism and coloniality are re-embedded into the system by calibrating the machine accordingly. And the half quote that I wanted to bring will, from a person who was not necessarily talking about 
biometric technologies, but I think it's very fitting to, in order to understand what biometric technologies set themselves to do, is John Cage, who said that measurements only measure measuring means. So measurements are only there to find out that what they were supposed to reveal in the first place. So in terms of biometric technologies and listening and voice, um, my focus has been on the use of so-called accent recognition software by the German Federal Office for Migration and Refugees, the Bundesamt für Migration und Flüchtlinge. Uh, so they began experimenting with this accent recognition software by the end of 2017. Allegedly, after the disastrous case of Franco A, who was a neo-Nazi German soldier who impersonated a Syrian refugee, got granted asylum, and had a plan, had a kill list, and a plan to commit a series of terror attacks and blame them on Syrian refugees. One key, one key component for his assessment as a Syrian refugee was his interview, uh, which supposedly takes place in the native language of the refugee in case, and he was approved, and this was also one of the components that granted him asylum, and that was done by uh, a human interpreter and then delegated to third party companies in Scandinavia for human assessment. So the software would allegedly replace that because of course, in his case, it was wrong, but um, quite interestingly, it was only in his case. Uh, so the software was implemented at first in 61 of the um, reception centers, the Ankunftszentrum and Außenstelle, so external offices of the, the Center for Migration and Refugees in Germany, and deployed whenever an asylum seeker could not provide a so-called material proof of themselves, a material proof of their own identities. And as you can see in this, uh, in this little chart there, by April 2018, that's the last data that was publicly released by the German uh, Office for Migration, the software had been deployed 9,883 times in asylum cases. And in response to the same inquiry that yielded this graphic, they said that the error margin of the software is 20%. So 20% of these asylum cases were probably denied upon uh, a mistake of the machine. And if you take 20% of 9,883, you get 1,977 ways of saying no. So I went to, to research uh, how this, this software came to be in the first place, who the German government bought it from, and so on and so forth, and uh, um, accounts are different depending on who you ask, but one, one thing is for sure is that the databases that they use to train this software, so they, they call the speech corpus, the speech corpora that they, they, they use to train the software, they were all bought from the University of Pennsylvania who owns like a large collection of uh, speech databases. Um, and the capabilities of the software at first were tuned, specifically tuned for speakers of Levantine, Egyptian, and Gulf variations of Arabic. Even though the neo-Nazi soldier never spoke Arabic on his interview, he spoke French. Um, and when you browse the University of Pennsylvania's catalog of uh, speech databases, you see that the most popular ones amongst the Arabic dialect variants are called call friend or call home. And this is one of the examples that you can find. Hello? So within the process of accent recognition, um, decisions that are taken by the software are, are based not on how speech happens, 
but instead on how a machine extracts these features of this speech. And these features are allegedly divorced, but never erased from the existence of said speech as a cultural phenomenon. So when a database that you have is called call home, and you have clearly a person talking to their mother, um, the content for the machine doesn't matter, but it matters for the speaker. And what matters is literally the quality of sound, especially because it comes from telephone conversations, and this becomes important later on. So how this accent recognition software actually works in place. So when an asylum seeker cannot um, provide a material proof of themselves, they are inquired to test their accents through the software. So they are taken to a room in one of these uh, um, centers, and there is in which there is a telephone, like an old landline telephone device. And then um, they have to speak freely for a maximum of two minutes um, within a given subject, which is accorded with them beforehand. Usually, uh, how it works is that it involves looking at a picture that is placed in front of you, um, then dial dialing a number, waiting for a beep, and then you tell the story to the telephone, describing the picture that is in front of you. On the other side of this telephone sits the software, and it gives you a document like this at the end, which tells you the probabilities that you speak certain languages. That the processing of the story implies some form of listening, be it human or machinic, does not necessarily mean that the affective power yielded by the content of the story matters. On the contrary, power lies exactly in the act of connecting the picture with the speaker, with the telephone. The only thing that matters is this little, in, uh, little index that you see, like the 0, 0,57 LLR, which stands for log likelihood ratio. So it is the probability that certain languages are spoken. By the way, this says that the person speaks uh, Egyptian Arabic with a 78.9% of um, certainty. And this uh, document is, a matter, as a matter of fact, is from a Palestinian person. Um, so the autonomy, when speaking to this software, the autonomy over one's sounding self is temporarily hijacked by the bond created between speaker telephone device and the room in which this is taking place. Where you become nothing but a subject of the accent recognition software being tested. The device of the telephone and the accent recognition software and the body become one single sounding self. The product of this equation, however, is used against the speaker as a material evidence, so to speak, of who they are. They become criteria that could define certain rights or lack thereof, meaning the right to stay. Lives are decided upon, lives are decided upon, predicated on the probabilities of certain languages being spoken, decided by a machine. The error margin is 20%. But the power relationships, in this case, they are not broken, they are not obscured, as it would be when you, when you do not have, like, when you ask a person to speak of a, uh, on a telephone and just tell a story. It might, seem, it might sound banal, it might sound trivial, but the power relationships are not obscured in that case. They become hyper-visible, they become hyper-audible. They become a clear example of Alexander Wehelia's uh, claim on the insistence, uh, uh, his insistence on the in-slash-audibility of race. So how race always works in this in-between of being silenced and at the same time immediately pinpointable as a performative gesture itself. So I'm really interested in this connection between the body and the telephone and, and the, 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 the space in which this interaction takes place. So to that, I, take my I turn my attention to Gloria Saldua, uh, Latina, late, unfortunately, Latina feminist poet and thinker. And she has extensively discussed the evoking power of objects and the abilities conjured by the act of storytelling when engaged with artifacts. So the presentness of a given object when invoked through write and story, she remarks, evinces that an object is 
quote, both a physical thing and the power that infuses it, end quote. So in a sense, what Anzaldúa was writing in the mid 80s reminds us that there is nothing necessarily new in the so-called new materialisms. In non-Western cosmologies, for instance, objects are always immediately imbued with the power relationships they contain. They help construct, and they are evoked in them by the stories told within and around these objects. The end result is never a thing fixed in time and space, but instead, and I quote her again, a beaded work with several light motifs appearing and disappearing in a crazy dance. In this case of the accent recognition software, for instance, the telephone as the sound mediating device, as an object imbued with the story that is being told in it, or the idea of a story being told to a, a, a machinic listening device, enacts this presentness in the very moment of testing, in the very moment of listening. Um, so my recent uh, work, not only my research that I'm doing on this minutiae of accent recognition, but also my artistic work involved with that in the past year or so, has been tackling these issues and also connecting these stories in time and space and history. So this, this uh, centers in which refugees and asylum seekers are being welcomed in Germany, uh, many of them, and where these accent tests are taking place as well, many of them are in the same sites that were former prisoner camps, especially during the First World War. Uh, and um, um, I have a, a really interest in, sp in specifically this place called the Königsfriedrich Friedrich August Kaserne in the city of Chemnitz, uh, it's in, in Saxony in Germany. Um, and I will tell you why in a second, but in most of these uh, prisoner camps, that becomes a funny, funny and quite scary historical connection because Exactly 100 years ago, so during 1914 until 1918 or 19, yeah, during the, like the, when, when the First World War was happening, there was the creation of the Preussische Phonographische Commission, so the, the Prussian Phonographic Commission. And one of their projects was to force imprisoned soldiers station, uh, imprisoned in these um, uh, camps, many of them colonial soldiers fighting their colonizers' war, to have their accents recorded and stored in shellac discs and cataloged. So this is the König Friedrich August Kazanne today. And this is the distance between, so on, on the right, you have the entrance of the former, the former prisoner camp. And on the left, you have the entrance of the uh, asylum seeking camp, so to speak. So the refugee camp as they, so, in 1917, especially in Chemnitz, in this day, um, that was happening mostly in 1917, prisoners of war had their accents recorded in shallot discs and cataloged by the Prussian Phonographic Commission. Um, so this is how one of the formulas that, they, that were filled by the, the Phonographic Commission looked like. This one specifically is from a colonial soldier, uh, originally from Martinique, so back then from a, from a former French colony. And in the end, right there in the bottom right corner, you see the assessment of the testing, the, the person who tested. In this case, the creator of the, the, the phonographic commission himself, he, Wilhelm Dürgen, uh, he says he has like a middle voice with a good um, pronunciation of consonants. So it was assessing his colonial French, essentially. Instead of a telephone, however, these accents were being recorded, of course, in a phonograph, and they had like a speaking cone and they also featured the gentle hand of the technician on the soldier's back, not as a gesture of, not, not as a gesture of kindness, but just to ensure that you get a scientifically objective recording and, and devoid of any uh, markers or, or noises or things that could um, jeopardize the quality of the recording. Il 
So in my, my artistic work, especially the, the piece that I'm finishing now for the, I mean, I performed this piece um, by the end of January in the CTM Festival in Berlin. And now I'm just finishing the, what will become like a radio broadcast by the end of May. I'm doing, I'm weaving these connections in time and history, but I'm also making something new with it. So for the past year or so, I've been um, inviting singers non-professional singers, most of them with migration backgrounds or migrants themselves, to perform content of these um, speech databases. Um, so we break down these speeches into phonemes as a machine would read them, not like as a phonetic alphabet kind of thing, but rather how machines are usually, um, how the, the, the content is input not only as sound, but also as phonemes to the to software in order to be understood. And this is performed uh, back to the space uh, and the, this piece that I'm, that I'm finishing now connects, ma makes all these connections in, that I just told you in, of course, way more depth, uh, but also brings something new by bringing singers to, to perform those things. So the way I'm approaching these databases um, is kind of as a, as, a, as a technique of refusal, so to speak. So I did this performance last year, was here in Brussels, by the way. Um, um, so these are the choir, the choir is called the Brussels Experimental on the conduction of Floris Lamens here on the, on the left. And it was sung by uh, Rasim Moussavi, Farida Lehian, and Mohamed Shaou. Uh, and we were singing text, like bureaucratic texts from the Belgian uh, immigration office about, uh, about the hearings that happened with, uh, with uh, asylum seekers here in Belgium. Uh, and I, I devise scores that look a little bit like this with the phonemes and etc. cetera, um, like so. So I'm trying to weave this connection and use voice to, to perform content for these databases, as I said, as moments of refusal. Refusal to participate in the continuation of uh, coloniality. Reclaiming autonomy over accents, autonomy over the sounding selves, and refusing to participate in the colonial reenactment of accent recognition or accent cataloging technologies. So I see these performances that, are, that I'm doing right now as pedagogical moments um, that project bodies considered to be non-normative, bodies considered to not to belong towards futures that do not assume coloniality as, as a starting point or not as an ending point, but devise other routes that stay in this in-between uh, of past, present, and future. This is an image from the CTM performance as well. Then I had um, three singers also doing the, the phoneme kind of routine. Um, so the nature of, of storytelling is repetition. Yet the nature of repetition is unequal. For those sustaining the colonial politics of sonic biometrics, for instance, the German Migration Office, the material content of the stories being told seem not to matter much. But they do, because they, they produce this very specific body. They sediment it for those two minutes. For the Phonographic Commission, as you, if you speak French, if you could understand, um, it was the biblical tale of the prodigal son. 
l'enfant prodigue, that sedimented the body who was lost, but now is found again. For the German migration authorities, the picture that you have to describe to the accent recognition software is that of a family eating together at home. Both of these um, stories, they, are, they elicit a sonic encapsulation of, that, is, of that, what, that which is unattainable. They require one to voice their longing for home, their, their, their desire to return home, to recall home through the articulation of voice, to the articulation of phonemes, to long for a home that may no longer be there. The assumption, we can perhaps speculate a little bit, is that in doing so, one becomes yet again closer to a certain form of a sonic nature. But for those in control of how those sounds should be produced, of what should be listened in them, what should be found in them, there's only one thing that matters, and it matters the most, that home should be never here. Home should be always elsewhere. Thank you. <laughs>